As HIC 55 is ongoing, we continue to witness the commission of atrocity crimes in all regions of the world. The Council has a prevention mandate, and UN member states have a legal and moral duty to respect and to ensure respect for international law, especially in cases of atrocity crimes, which refer to legally defined international crimes, genocide, crime against humanity, and war crimes. Resolving conflicts requires that states treat human rights as paramount and apply human rights laws and standards in a principled and consistent way. The selective and inconsistent application of international law is undermining the integrity of the framework and this very institution, as well as the credibility, legitimacy, and influence of states and other actors who engage in such double standards. We are grateful for the defenders coming to share their painful experiences, working to monitor, document, and mobilize to end impunity and foster accountability in extremely challenging environments where states and non-state actors are committing atrocity crimes against their communities. Their role is essential to understanding the situation on the ground, as well as to guide the international community in supporting effective measures to achieve accountability and justice. The role of special procedure mandate holders has been essential in raising the alarm in situations of atrocity crimes and ensuring that the voices of defenders are amplified. We are very grateful for the participation of the Special Rapporteur on the Victims' Housing and the victim participation of the Special Rapporteur on Food. Our four esteemed human rights defenders would address now the role of civil society and the UN human rights body in raising alarm around atrocity crimes and mobilizing the international community. I will now turn to Tahani Abbas from Sudan, who will speak in Arabic. Interpretation is available on Channel. Thank you, Nida. My greetings and my heartfelt thanks for contributing to the participation of this meeting. Greetings to the Sudanese people with its women and girls and men against all the dictators. And my greetings and respect for the Sudanese girls who are faced with atrocious atrocities like rape. And so many other crimes, the uh, girls and the women and the sons in the Sudan are suffering from the ravages of the war between the uh, government forces and the, uh, the RS of the rapid support forces. the human rights defenders to document and to provide services to the war that was waged on the 15th of April. Many atrocities have been documented in cooperation with the civil society and they have documented 185 uh, sexual violence cases and they were committed um, evidently by the RSF in uh, Khartoum and in uh, the province of Al Jazeera, the city of Madani at the middle of the Sudan where uh, thousands of Sudanese have been displaced. And then uh, there is a war in Madani, which led the war of the 15th of April, led to the displacement of 8 million Sudanese in terms of the IDPs, and uh, 18 uh, million are faced with famine, grade 5. I come from the Sudan. Like uh, a month ago, I arrived in Nairobi, Kenya, after 
society of the Sudan, and especially when it comes to sexual violence, we are being threatened, and we are faced with the possibility of losing all potentialities in terms of money, funds, that uh, should be available to the civil society organizations, and uh, the and uh, one of the tools that are being used as a, as a weapon is the sexual violence by the ISF. The, the, the rarity of, uh, of resources as well is one of the uh, problems we are faced with. There is a, a good aim. And many of the survivors are faced with the prevention of the delivery of humanitarian assistance. There the, the are over eight millions are faced with famine. And many of the international organizations concerned with the accountability and the international human rights law, they have to work on equal footing with all countries. I feel very angry and sad, and at the same time, I feel responsible towards the survivors of the Sudanese girls who have been kidnapped. And there are more than 45 girls have been kidnapped by the RSF, and they are being sexually exploited and sold. Thank you very much. It's causing the international community not to turn a blind eye to the atrocities and large scale sexual violence unfolding in Sudan. I will now turn to human rights defender Ahmad Abulfoul. He was born and raised in Gaza. He is an international lawyer, legal researcher, and advocacy officer at Al Haq. Ahmad, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing this uh, important um, event, and I appreciate the enthusiasm of such an uh, important question. Um, you want me to cover it in three minutes, so I'll do my best. I think it's, it's a challenge. Uh, human rights defenders around the world are usually the first responders to atrocity crimes and they therefore play a crucial role in ensuring uh, um, accountability uh, for such crimes. Uh, in particular, their work in monitoring and documenting such crimes paves the way later to and empower accountability mechanisms and provide them with the necessary information and the requisite documentation needed uh, to pursue accountability. Um, I'll speak a bit about Al Haq and what we do. Al Haq was established in 1979 in Ramallah. Uh, Al Haq is the first uh, uh, human rights organization in Palestine and in the region. And we work uh, to promote and um, uh, human rights uh, of the Palestinian people, the individual and collective rights of the Palestinian people in the occupied Palestinian uh, territory and beyond. And we do that by way of monitoring, documenting uh, violations, and by way of advocacy before 
international accountability mechanisms. This includes the ICC, ICJ, the, um, uh, the UN, including the Human Rights Council, Special Procedure, the High Commissioner o Office, uh, and many others. And we, we do that by um, um, sending communications, submissions, uh, issuing reports, um, and submit, bri submit often confidential submissions to such accountability mechanisms of providing um, uh, evidence of the commission of crime. So when we do our advocacy and we uh, say clearly that it's long overdue for Israeli perpetrators to be held accountable, we say that um, with confidence because we have the evidence uh, needed to uh, prove uh, uh, these crimes. And here, if you allow me, um, uh, I would like to, to make it clear and um, reiterate our position that is, it is long overdue for the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to issue arrest warrants for crimes committed in Palestine. There is no justification for the delay. Uh, our position is clear that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is clearly dragging his feet and he needs to deliver on his mandate without fear. Uh, or favor. Um, the aggression uh, on the Gaza Strip at the moment and the, the unfolding genocide ha has had the catastrophic consequences on the civilian population in Gaza, but also on human rights defenders. For the first time in our history since 1979, we had to announce that we're unable to cover the situation in the Gaza Strip properly because our colleagues uh, had to flee their homes, have to, be, to, to protect themselves and their families. Some of them, uh, their homes have been destroyed. Uh, and some of them lost family members, including myself. And the decision we had to make is between survival or documenting uh, uh, the violations. But um, more respect and appreciation to my colleagues on the ground who still do their best together with other human rights organizations cooperating and coordinating to document uh, what they can. What is unfortunate, to be honest, at this critical moment is that uh, certain states stopped funding for human rights organization in, the, in this dire times. And uh, um, uh, states that often uh, uh, breach about international law, about human rights, uh, and they showed uh, um, really lack of... Uh, uh, of interest or sympathy with the situation. Uh, and if, if history of armed conflict has taught us something, is that in such situations where there is no human rights defenders on the ground documenting these violations, this often encourages and emboldens the perpetrators, and we have seen that. We have seen it in South Africa case before the International Court of Justice, where it showed uh, Israeli soldiers are bragging about their crimes, filming it because they feel invincible, they're untouchable. Uh, the, mis the, the missed puzzle in the situation in Palestine is accountability, is justice, and um, I will end uh, this part of my intervention by reminding myself and, uh, and you all of what Benjamin Friend said in Nuremberg. He was prosecutor of, of Nuremberg after World War II, and he said, and I quote, there can be no peace without justice, and no justice without law, and no meaningful law without a court to decide what is just and lawful under any given circumstance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for your intervention. And just to uh, reiterate the call by special procedures, including the Special Rapporteur on Housing during the interactive dialogue yesterday, that have repeatedly raised alarm on the situation and called on states to implement an Arab embargo in Israel, heightened by the International Court of Justice ruling that there is a plausible risk of genocide in Gaza. I will now turn to Yasmin Ullah, feminist Rohingya human rights activist. Her family fled to Thailand after a wave of violence in Arakun in 1995. She is currently leading a Rohingya-led, women-led, and refugee-led organization, the Rohingya Maya Fuya Noor Collaboration Collaborative Network. Yasmin, the floor is yours. Um, I'm quite honored to be here sharing the panel with such esteemed um, panelists. And, um, First, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I have been an advocate for a long time, but uh, Rohingya Mayafona Collaborative Network has just begun our work as a collective. And um, even though we've just begun, we have a collective experience of about you know, two decades. 
and our work is focused currently on the ASEAN region and the responsibility that the ASEAN, um, ASEAN Association as a collective has over uh, the mass atrocities that happen in its front yard. The issue today is not just about the recurrence of violence that has been, you know, ongoing for a very, very long time, over the past decades, and uh, the, the, the current updates that we heard from the ground are also quite worrisome, which I will go into in a minute. I would like to remind all of us here that it was the international community's complicity to the Myanmar geno uh, Rohingya genocide uh, uh, and other mass atrocities that actually put us in this position in the first place. It was all the business dealings, it was all the, the funds and the money that goes into the pocket of the military junta that has actually funded the genocide and other mass atrocities across Burma, Myanmar. Now, let me remind you that there were six military bases that were built and 400 villages of Rohingya that, was completely, that were completely wiped off the map uh, right after the 2017 uh, clearance operation by the Myanmar junta. These areas, these land, were primed for the business incentives. And it was now, it's actually now has been redeveloped by Chinese companies. Over the past few years, um, this was the research that was done by um, uh, an Australian think tank. The deep sea port was completed right around January 2018. The pipeline was also, pipeline project by Shui Gas was also completed right after the Rohingya uh, fled to uh, Cox Bazaar en masse. Now, over one million people are stuck in dire situations in Cox Bazaar uh, refugee camps. Young children have no access to education. Uh, livelihood is not something we can even talk about because uh, it's worsening every single day. All of this uh, lead to the idea that the Rohingya were wiped off or annihilated or expelled from the country for a very specific heinous purpose. Not only that, but sexual and gender-based violence was also weaponized, used, in order to drive out the Rohingya and instill the fear among the community to ensure that people don't come back. And that is exactly what we're seeing. The international community is not only responsible for everything that we're currently dealing with, but it's important for all of us to actually take into consideration that there are connections to all of these mass atrocities um, beyond, you know, what the panelists have talked about today. Especially when we look at the solidarity that's built or the kind of precedence that was set by the Gambia's um, uh, legal case at the um, International Court of Justice, this actually laid down the groundwork for the Palestinian case to follow suit especially on the universality of the responsibility to prevent genocide. Today, Rohingya are being forced, forcefully conscripted into fighting with the military junta in Myanmar because the military junta is actually losing the grounds in the country due to resistance by the people after the attempted coup in 2021. However, in Arakan, because Arakan army is currently fighting and trying to uh, wedge Rohingya in the middle, and as you've heard from the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, as he's reported um, on this, there were 45 airstrikes that has been, uh, uh, that was in place. And on 27th of January alone, so many people have had to be displaced. Over 100,000 people are currently displaced internally in Arakan, in Rakhine State. All of these people are being starved to death because of this war, because of the fight, and because Rohingya are always sitting in the crossfire. Here is the issue of impunity, in the, not only in the military junta, but also the impunity among ethnic armed groups that are not actually instilling um, or working on accountability measures to ensure that civilian lives are actually protected. We actually also just came back from uh, Malaysia, and I will end with this, Malaysia and Indonesia last year and this year. Um, the hate campaigns there were quite extraordinary in a way that, that is terrible. Um, We've been working on the transnational repression, and we suspect that there are worse and more insidious plan at play 
by the junta. Um, in, in, inciting the hate, the, the hate campaigns among Malaysians and Indonesians because these are the frontiers of the front line for where Rohingya would, would um, for where the human flow would go in terms of Rohingya fleeing the genocide and fleeing violence in Arakan. And this is actually um, our worries. So without actual meaningful participation of Rohingya and groups like us, it would be almost impossible for you to keep up but also for, for all of us to be able to actually work on collective solidarity and ensure that non-recurrence is actually uh, going to be a way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for your intervention and reminding us of the role of businesses in violations. And in 2019, to just uh, a, uh, an example, the fact that Muslim and Myanmar established how the military used its own businesses, foreign companies, and arms deals to support crimes against ethnic groups, including uh, the Rohingya. Um, I will now move to our last speaker for this round uh, online. She's joining us on Zoom, Zumrutai uh, Aikin. She's the Director of Global Advocacy at the World Uyghur Congress. She is also the Chair of the Women's Committee of the World Uyghur Congress. Zumrutai, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nara, um, and thank you to ICHR for organizing such a timely event on um, a west of China, where um, my community, my people, have been subjected to um, atrocity crimes since 2017 with mass incarcerations of, of millions of people for their religious and ethnic um, identity. Um, and I think in this context, it, since 2017, but also before that, the role of human rights defenders have been vital um, in advancing responsibility in uh, paired with the also role played by UN experts and human rights bodies in uh, raising alarm around atrocity crimes. Um, I think um, together these experts, human rights defenders, and human rights bodies have uh, meaningfully contributed to passing accountability mechanisms and also providing some sort of justice path to victims. Um, and I think one of the vital roles played by UN experts, specifically by special rapporteurs and treaty bodies, has been documentation of atrocity crimes because it's an essential component of justice and, and accountability. And especially in our case, where access to information and data has become extremely difficult over the past few years, where there's this huge firewall, um, and the Chinese government has really uh, made it impossible to access to not only family members, but also all kinds of data and information that is crucial in documentation. But uh, with research from scholars, experts, um, and also NGO reports, media reports, um, UN experts have been able to um, gather this um, this information into reports, communications, which has been extremely useful for human rights defenders um, such as um, myself and others to bring this to the attention of the international community. And I think most of the time, um, these experts also report on situations that have fallen off the official agenda of the Human Rights Council um, due to many reasons, um, including political considerations. So I think they play a role as filling in the gap uh, that exists there. And um, in our case, for example, China has fallen off the official agenda of the Human Rights Council for many, many years, although there was attempts, of course, to bring this uh, to the Human Rights Council and, and as well as other bodies. Um, and I think the human experts and human rights bodies are often the first ones to also sound the alarm from dire situations requiring the urgent attention of bodies like the Human Rights Council and others, and which is also built on the work that is done by civil society and human rights defenders. Um, so I think they, they are, um, their work together is extremely uh, valuable and important, but we have to continue supporting that. Um, and I guess also another point that is important is um, my, my colleague Yasmin has also raised the issue of transnational repression, and this is another um, 
factor that must be considered in, um, in, in this space are for human rights defenders, especially human rights defenders that are countering um, authoritarian governments um, often where we are subjected to abuses, subjected to retaliation and transnational oppression, including at the United Nations. Um, so it's um, having the UN experts, human rights bodies, having these kind of confidential um, settings, confidential uh, processes can help um, to build this more accessible route and safer route for defenders um, who are at risk as reprisals. So I think um, that's another um, important factor that must uh, be um, that must be discussed as well, uh, because uh, for victims, uh, especially for families, defenders and victims, having uh, UN uh, experts uh, be a direct access, have a direct access to them is extremely, um, extremely helpful in, um, in raising the alarm on atrocity uh, crimes uh, situations as well. Um, and of course, um, just to put it lastly, um, the reporting of these bodies and human, human rights experts um, is extremely valuable because it's considered to be a, an independent voice, but also an independent and le um, legitimate source um, where human rights defenders or civil society organizations are not taken seriously um, all the time, especially when they are... Um, working, uh, countering um, authoritarian governments where they are exposed to different uh, sorts of challenges, including this kind of um, challenging of the sources that are used, especially um, instrumentalizing these uh, human rights atrocities as well. So I think um, the role played by these three different stakeholders are extremely valuable and just also a reminder that they also work um, in, in conjunction and also complementing each other's um, work as well. Thank you for reminding us also of uh, reprisals faced by human rights defenders, including in the UN. And uh, we reiterate the call by over 40 UN experts and hundreds of human rights organizations globally to call on the Council to uphold the integrity of its mandate and establish a monitoring and reporting mechanism in China. I will now turn to the Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing, Mr. Bala Krishnan Rajakopal, who will focus on violations to economic, social, and cultural rights. Thank you, Special Rapporteur. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I don't have to remind people in this room, and certainly not the people in this panel, of course, that. Um, too many atrocities are being committed, and uh, instead of uh, preventing and punishing these atrocities, in fact, what we are increasingly seeing is silence and uh, complicity. And um, many of us in the UN uh, Human Rights um, Expert Mechanism, the Special Procedures Branch, have been um, calling attention to this, both in terms of individual cases, but also structurally. Uh, as a problem in many countries. The human rights defenders are, are represented on this panel are among the most symptomatic of these dynamics from countries uh, such as Sudan and, of course, Palestine and uh, Myanmar and uh, countless other countries where such human rights defenders are literally putting their lives on the line and are uh, subjected to violence, intimidation, imprisonment, torture, killings, and uh, what we find uh, that is quite relevant to my mandate on right to adequate housing and uh, land is that uh, among the most at risk who are facing these kinds of risks are people who defend uh, housing rights and land rights. In fact, if you defend land rights, you can be pretty sure that uh, you are a marked person in most countries. Something bad is coming your way sooner or later. And um, unfortunately, uh, the shrinking of civic space that we've been witnessing over the last uh, two decades or so, gradually, but increasing in momentum in many countries, has made it more difficult for other people in their own countries who may disagree with this kind of level of intimidation and threats against defenders, or media, for example, who might want to report on it, from being unable to do so, because they themselves face retaliation and threats. So it's a very dire situation, really. 
And the reason why it matters is because human rights defenders are the critical nodal points in global social movements that seek to effect progressive change, both uh, locally as well as regionally and nationally. Without these nodal points being nurtured and cultivated and kept safe, the whole network falls apart. So it's very important that we have a systemic view of the importance of human rights defenders. In my own academic writings, I have referred to this kind of network reality that human rights defenders and others who are victims seek to highlight and, and the efforts that they make to uphold a new version of international law as international law from below. It's a different international law from that of diplomats and texts and treaties. It's an international law of lived reality. And they seek to highlight it, they seek to contest it, and they seek to post alternative interpretations of it. Now, my own advocacy for domicide, by which um, I have meant uh, widespread or systematic destruction of uh, housing and civilian infrastructure uh, in conflict, which I put forward in my report to the UN General Assembly in 2022, when the Russian bombing of Ukraine was on everybody else's mind. But now, of course, we see it in every conflict, most notoriously now in the case of Gaza. The reason I put forward the case of domicile is because of this precise idea that increasingly this is the lived reality of too many dispossessed people on the planet. Their homes are getting destroyed in vast numbers and without any remedy and faced with silence and complicity. And this cannot be, this cannot be the international law that we can live with. This cannot be the international law that can defend any sense of order based on justice. So we need to change that. And as far as genocide is concerned, um, I've spoken most uh, often about Gaza. But there is no question that it's committed on a very large scale in Myanmar, for example. It's being committed in Sudan. It's being committed in a variety of other contexts where wantonly homes are destroyed. And homes are destroyed, you don't just lose four walls and a roof or a property. You lose your memories. You lose the things that give meaning to your life. You lose the things that you remember and the things that give you comfort and familiarity and a sense of dignity. And you lose all of that. It's not possible to replace it just by giving you money. It can be a very traumatic and long-term process to recover from the loss of a home. And unfortunately, this is not fully really recognized, and that goes to the point that I think that, broadly speaking, in international law, we've had an inherited problem, and by, I call it basically a double, double uh, standard. Not just a double standard, but a double, double standard. Let's call it DS squared, right? Double standard squared. The first double standard is basically that there has been a long-term structural bias in favor of the powerful states against uh, less powerful people and states in international law. And this manifests itself in a variety of different ways. Uh, part of it is the biased nature of the way international institutions themselves function. For example, the operation of the ICC. No sort of awareness it is a shooter against people from Africa, as we know very well, except for a few exceptions now in the case of Russia. It's just not an even handed court at this stage. Of course, I stand to be proved wrong in the coming years. I hope I'm proved wrong. But that is one type of bias. The second type of bias is a structural or systemic bias against economic, social, and cultural rights in favor of civil and political rights that have long been part of international law. When people die or suffer because of lack of housing or food, it's simply not newsworthy enough. It's just not the sort of thing that I guess people in rich countries can relate to, because house, food and housing is plenty, it's not an issue. But I think that this double, double standard is something that uh, we need to face squarely, and that's one of the reasons that I propose the idea of domicile. I want to be very clear, I don't expect prosecutions are as the only, if not the main way to sort of get what we want out of advocating for domicile. Because going back to what I said about human rights defenders and their role in social movements, it's the advocacy at the people's level, the enunciation of a people's law, and even institutionalizing such advocacy through mechanisms such as people's tribunals, which have been long used around global affairs, starting with, say, the Vietnam War. Uh, 
that we would seek to delegitimize narratives that actually seek to impose a variety of forms of suffering that are silent and makes too many people complicit with it. So I hope we can change that. Thank you so much, Special Rapporteur, for reminding us of the human impact of these violations and of home destructions, but also um, for calling on the international community to abide by its standards and its laws and to address uh, the situation based on its merits and uh, to for us as civil society and the international community to address these atrocity crimes and the need for the international law to evolve to ensure accountability and justice. I will now turn to the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, who has uh, provided us with a video statement, pre-recorded statement. Hello, my name is Michael Buckley, and I'm the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. I apologize that I'm unable to attend this event in person or live due to my schedule. The topic of this event is incredibly important because without human rights defenders, human rights would be meaningless. The work of human rights defenders plays a key role, both in mobilizing local communities to organize and also in triggering state and international institutions to take action. Human rights defenders also provide a long-standing record of what is going on as they bear witness to people's struggles. In the context of the right to food, it is the work of human rights defenders working to protect people's relationship to the land, rivers, and sea that is very important. This is because the right to food includes the right to be free from hunger. The main causes of hunger are never the result of not enough food. Hunger is always caused by denying people access to what they need to eat good food. So that means that everyone has the right to be free from oppression, exploitation, dispossession, and occupation. Ultimately, people's fate is significantly determined by their access to land and waterways and their ability to steward the land and water. Access to land, rivers, and sea, and secure tenure rights are essential for the enjoyment of the right to food. Inadequate and insecure tenure rights lead to conflict and environmental degradation when competing users fight for control of these resources. I've been seriously concerned by the increasing rate of threats and attacks against land and environmental defenders. I'm also concerned about the increasing rate of the use of hunger and starvation as a weapon in atrocity crimes, whether it's in Yemen, the Congo Karabakh, China, Myanmar, Gaza, Sudan, or anywhere. Hunger and starvation are increasingly used as part of campaigns of ethnic cleansing or genocide, as we see from the different experiences of the different peoples of Sudan and of the Palestinian, Uyghur, and Rohingya peoples. It is well established that people defending uh, communities' land rights and ecosystems are human rights defenders. Agribusiness corporations not only violate human rights with impunity through commercial activity, they are also frequently implicated in the murder of human rights defenders. Threatening, attacking, and killing land and environmental defenders usually has the aim of intimidating local communities, stopping people from defending their territory. And therefore, we should understand the killing of human rights defenders as acts of terror and assassination. To threaten, attack, or kill land and environmental defenders is an attempt to weaken a people's food system. It is an attempt to weaken a very people themselves, to make them vulnerable. In turn, to protect land and environmental defenders is one key way to realize the right to food. Protecting human rights defenders is also uh, a key to protect people's food sovereignty and to make people stronger, enabling the people to able to continue to struggle for a life with dignity. I wish you all the best uh, in this side event. Thank you very much.
shedding light on the use of starvation as a weapon of atrocity crimes in the context addressed by our speakers. And I will now turn to the defenders to address the gap between the expert positions and the application of international law and standards by UN member states and provide their recommendations. You each have three minutes. Thank you once again. The right uh, to uh, housing. Uh, I represent um, uh, schools of uh, women as defenders. Uh, and I have uh, uh, been faced with the complete demolition of uh, my house. Uh, where I had my children were born, and uh, we uh, constructed a new house in the, the middle part of the Sudan, which we have lost again. So I'm not only speaking on behalf of uh, the schools of the uh, uh, human rights defenders, but uh, let me tell you that there are uh, many other uh, defenders uh, that have been uh, uh, like uh, displaced three times. We in the Sudan, we pay tribute uh, to the special procedures and, uh, and we call upon uh, the international community represented uh, by the independent uh, rapporteur and uh, the fact-finding mission to uh, invite them to come to the Sudan and to see for themselves to see the displacement and the demolition. And you can communicate with them, and they are ready to give you all the information necessary. The fact finding mission started to deal with those groups that are specialized in sexual of violence, and we are ready to submit all information, all data. And now we have over 20 million children outside the education institutions. The demolition of the health infrastructure led to the death of the hundreds of the, um, thousands of uh, children for lack of health services. Also, uh, the mortality of women as a result of AIDS, there are so many other dangers. And there are many violations that have been uh, perpetrated. The special procedures, we pay uh, attention and we have high hopes that uh, the special procedures would communicate with the organized defenders in a closer manner. And we hope uh, that uh, many uh, human rights uh, defenders uh, in the uh, resistance committees, they were very uh, uh, were lost uh, because they were working on the ground uh, since uh, the April War. And we pay tribute uh, to their uh, solidarity. However, it is uh, impossible to reach out to the human rights defenders unless they travel elsewhere. And uh, there are so many other problems like the lack of uh, visas, entry visas. They lost, uh, in many cases, they lost all their properties. And they started from scratch once again. So here, I would like to thank the international organizations that are supported. We came all the way from Africa so that our voice would be heard. We are there. We exist. And we have, there are many activists 
and the Sudan who are ready to sacrifice their lives in order to give you the truth. We have so many data, so many information, and the whole world should change its outlook because one person lost so many friends, many family members. And today, the arts are the ones who are demolishing our houses. And the Sudanese armed forces say that the RSF forces should come out. And the same accusation comes on the the hands of the RSF. So we were forced to get out of our homes, which is very close to the military headquarters of the army. So we still have very vivid information, and we are ready to, co to share these information with international organizations. Thank you. This is an important question. The, the, the gap between experts' positions, which I think represent the eyes and ears of the international community, and the positions of states uh, cannot be clear, I think. Uh, and in my view, this gap is created by a lack of political uh, will from states to enforce international law, which, in my view, reflects, in all honesty, um, um, uh, certain states' moral bankruptcy uh, um, it, it is also created by the irresponsible, distorted interpretation and misrepresentation of the rules of international law, not only uh, in, in the case of Palestine by Israel's colonial and apartheid regime, but also by its Western allies, and they do it shamelessly. I will give one example. You often hear Israel have the right to self-defense. Self-defense is regulated under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. The International Court of Justice has already said in 2004 that Israel does not have this right because Israel is an occupying power. This is a right for states when they're attacked by another state. If we were to presume there is a, a, a non-consensus in international law about whether a state can invoke rights of self-defense against a non-state actor, there is absolutely no doubt that an occupying power cannot invoke the rights of defense against the people it occupies because international law, international humanitarian law recognizes resistance groups and gives them the right to resist the occupation. So in brief, as long as the occupied Palestinian territories are occupied, Israel have no right to self-defense and the Palestinians have every right to resist. This is international law, whether you like it or not. And, uh, unfortunately, what we see from Western states, as I said, is a distorted interpretation of international law. And they do it irresponsibly, in my view, because it harms the very system that after World War II somewhat provided stability uh, in this world. This gap uh, is also created by the hypocrisy, double standards, selectivity. I'm not going to delve a lot in the comparison between the situation in Ukraine and Palestine. I think it imposes itself, and you just need to look at the, at the reactions. Some, somehow, rights of determination is important in Ukraine, it's irrelevant in Palestine. Resistance is important in Ukraine, and even Western TVs teach Ukrainians how to do Molotov cocktails, but Palestinians are deemed terrorists for whatever they do. Can any of our Western colleagues tell us how the Palestinians can resist? Because I work for a human rights organization that was labeled as terrorist. Not one or being or Western state did anything, although they rejected the designations, but they stand in passiveness. Go ahead, Israel. Israel designated human rights organizations as terrorists, raided their offices, put them in prison, and Israel's Western allies who preach about the democracy, none of them did anything. As I said, they even cut funding from a human, a human rights organizations and made a genocide. This will be recorded in history, and history will not be kind to those who contributed to the oppression of the Palestinian people. Um, uh, briefly, there's some, some examples. Western uh, allies will tell you they believe in two-state solution, but they only recognize one. They will tell you Israeli settlements are illegal, but they continue on both settlements, effectively financing it. Uh, they will tell you that they reject designations and criminalization of human rights defenders, but they do nothing. So uh, it, it, it's actually quite shameful. The recommendations are really clear. What we need is a principle, responsible, and consistent application of international law. 
International law is not only depend, is not, it doesn't depend on the skin color of the perpetrator or the victim. International law is supposed to be uh, international. What needs to be done is an armed embargo on Israel, because Israel is in a rogue state and an apartheid regime that continues to kill Palestinians every day. What needs to be done is imposing sanctions. And the Western world has shown us that it can mobilize international law in the case of Ukraine. We've seen it. You showed us how you do it. So why not in, in this situation uh, when it comes to Palestine? It needs to strengthen and support UNRWA. Not cut funding from it. It's quite disgraceful, to be honest. Cutting funding from UNRWA without even receiving a shred of evidence while the Palestinians have to show you the dead on camera to believe that the Palestinians are dying. It's quite racist, uh, to say the least, to be honest. Uh, states must also abide by their legal obligations under the Genocide Convention and ensure that Israel comply with the ICJ ruling. I will stop there. Thank you. I think it bears repeating that um, the business and human rights framework is not always applied in the case of mass atrocities you know, across the board. And potentially this serve or um, potentially this risk a lot of the situation to, to worsen over time. Uh, I think the intentions and prevention and uh, the frameworks that, that are available all over, um, especially, you know, through special procedures, uh, remind us that uh, early warning sign is often not taken seriously. And so it, it bears repeating that uh, early warning sign should be heated, should be accompanied by urgent actions, um, and and states are responsible to actually take these steps. Um, secondly, the double standard at hand, um, unfortunately, on the Rohingya case, ASEAN and many others in the Asia Pacific region is complicit in, in the violations and discrimination towards Rohingya refugees and those in exile. Um, through hate campaigns and various incitement of hate towards Rohingya that manifest into violence. These are something that our human rights defenders and our community has been working tirelessly on, but because states don't quite comply with the community's uh, urgent recommendations, it actually often uh, lead to various different um, uh, lack of actions and ignore, uh, ignoring the early warning signs and basically reproduction of genocide and violence. And lastly, I think um, it's important to bear this uh, repetition um, that a lot of these states are actually in support of one cause but selectively choosing one cause over the other. And that, that is just telling us there's a lot of hypocrisy at hand. And I think we need to reassess and re, um, re-examine uh, why international law is only a to one case and not the other. Why one group is, uh, you know, worthy of protection and not the other. Lastly, I think it's important to also realize that the communities are the one that move the needle. The communities are the one that come in here, knocking on the doors, kicking down the doors, and trying to actually create some changes. And so I think it's important for us to now realize it's so dire for us to actually listen and listen with actual um, understanding that the states need to move, the Human Rights Council need to move things, and the international mechanism need to move. Thank you. Thank you so much to all defenders. I will give the conclusion to Zumi Itai online. Thank you. I'll be very brief because I think my colleagues have really touched on uh, really crucial points. I think the issue of selectivity and polit- uh, lack of political will is the main obstacle. Atrocity crimes, whether it's the, um, the, the case on Palestine, whether it's the Uyghur um, genocide or Rohingya genocide and others, um, there's obviously there's this big gap between what the UN experts um, have uh, assessed and what the states are actually applying. Um, I think the failed resolution, project resolution on China uh, really demonstrates that. And I think it's our, our responsibility to remind states regularly of the founding principles of the United Nations, which is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Those are the founding principles that must be protected and uphold. And the polit- and political agendas and considerations should not come at the cost of human lives. And I think we have to work together to address all of these atrocity crimes everywhere around the world. And that activity should not be the obstacle to in addressing. Uh, in the case of China, there's been so many different um, documentations, um, the OSHA report, 170, um, 
seven communications since 2018, uh, different uh, concluding observations, press releases, and lastly, the uh, SIR decision under its early warning and urgent action procedure that was issued in uh, November 2022, which has actually referred the matter to the attention of the special advisor of, of the Secretary General on the respons responsibility to protect. We have not seen any meaningful action for addressing the issue, um, which is supposed to be within the mandate of the Joint Office of Order 2P. Um, so I would really call this Joint Office to address the Uyghur atrocities, Crimes and also, uh, I think lastly, I want to also highlight the importance that um, the role of uh, played by the Secretary General as well as the High Commissioner, because they they are uh, the the main uh, spokespersons of the United Nations. They have to voice out concerns, especially um, really sounding the alarm on atrocity crimes around the world, and not be selective. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone, to our speakers and to the special procedures. Uh, we really appreciate